three more guests now uh, to talk more about what they learned at JP Morgan and uh, what's happening in the world of digital health. And uh, really happy to welcome Howard Rosen, uh, Robert Garber, and Julie Kane. And uh, they'll do short introductions to themselves, but uh, very excited to hear from this next panel <clears throat> about not only uh, digital health investments, uh, but also some of the consumer adoption trends that we're seeing uh, come up in 2023. Uh, Howard, great to have you on the program. Thanks for joining. Great. Thank you, Stan, for the introduction. I really appreciate that. And again, I'm honored to be moderating this panel with Robert and Julie. Uh, very quickly, in terms of my background, it's, uh, for those that don't know, it's very traditional for health IT. I was educated as an MBA. I spent 15 years producing film and television. And so, of course, the natural segue into health IT when in 2005, it came upon this idea of creating this uh, communication platform for patients and providers. Um, so which during the course of 15 years, I gathered and been awarded seven patents and worked with the federal space and in the private healthcare space. And about two years ago, uh, part of the succession plan after 15 years of being the solopreneur, entrepreneur and running the company, I stepped down. And now, as you sort of some, I'm CEO of Nova Insights, which is really a consultancy taking both of both work, taking both worlds, where I do strategic consulting on innovation, uh, dealing with what I call humanizing digital transformation, and actually work with um, investor groups in terms of doing, for lack of a better term, SWOT analyses on solutions on uh, uh, prospect companies or in portfolio companies, which of course is the I'd like to think a perfect segue into introducing formerly Julie Kane and Robert Garber. And as our time is limited, let's jump into this. And Julie, please uh, give us a bit of your background. Thanks, Howard. Um, so uh, I'm Julie Kane, the CEO of Democracy Investments. Uh, we have a strategy that tilts an international equity portfolio towards democracy and away from authoritarians using the Economist Democracy Index. And uh, given that authoritarians' healthcare system generally have poor life expectancy, less effective health coverage, higher levels of out-of-pocket spending, uh, we, we feel like democracies are, are better suited to help further um, improvements in, in global healthcare. Um, I began my career as a naval aviator. So early in life, I was stationed in places less democratic and saw firsthand the importance of a good public healthcare system. And um, it's an honor to be here today. Well, that's great, Julie, and looking forward to your insights. And uh, Robert, why don't you jump in with your background and we can get to the questions. Thanks, Howard, and thanks, Stan, for having me. Uh, again, my name is Robert Garber. I'm a partner with Seven Wire Ventures based in Chicago. I'm on year uh, 26 and as an early stage investor, all focused on the intersection of health and technology. Um, most of our investing uh, time is spent building what we call informed, connected health consumers, um, which is how do we work with the enterprise stakeholders who have risk for the cost of care, but really with the idea of empowering all of us to be better stewards of our health uh, and our health care. Uh, and so, um, you know, this is near and dear to my heart, and uh, we spend every day trying to build companies that allow us to live health healthier and happier lives. And before I was an investor, I spent 10 years on the operating side as an entrepreneur, wearing every hat from a uh, bottle and dishwasher to a uh, CEO. So uh, good to be here today. Thanks. Well, great. Thanks. And so as a fellow dishwasher, um, why don't you just start off with how do we see 2023 going to be different from 2022? As we know, 2022 is, the lack of a better term, certainly was not a static kind of year. And uh, we don't seem to be going that way for this year already. Uh, yeah, I, look, it's going to be a mixed year. Um, I know we're, you know, some of us were at JPM a couple of weeks ago. It was certainly more subdued than normal. Um, you know, economic news continues to be mixed. Yesterday we had uh, some positive economic news on the jobs front and and uh, uh, economic growth, but you know, we're still seeing a lot of the systemic challenges in the healthcare systems. You know, labor costs are still up 20, 25 percent. Inflation is high. Uh, and so I, I think we still have some choppy waters to get through this year. You know, the positive, it's a good time to be investing. You know, prices have gone down. Uh, there are more mature assets to be uh, to be added to the portfolio, but um, I don't think we're out of the woods yet. Julie? Yeah, so we're hearing that hospitals have been operating at a 50 to 70% loss in 2022 and are 
the same time seeing a slowdown in uh, the venture investing world, although while well, the, the later stage has had seen significant drop off, there's there's still some investing in the seed stage. So that they're still investing in exploration. Um, obviously, we learned that COVID has strained healthcare systems and worker conditions are a challenge. Um, and with the global economic slowdown, as Robert just mentioned, um, I think it's going to be challenging for spending. It will it will fall in terms of real terms because of inflation. And on top of that, with the the, the shifting of supply chains, where I think we're going to see an increase in drug makers cost, and it'll be challenging for the next year. Well, as I said, as we try to help prevent some of the people from uh, getting their seventh cup of coffee or jumping out the windows beside themselves. Yeah. Um, why don't we mix uh, mix up? So what is the more? What is the? You know, obviously, many areas of issue and concern. Where would you see is the, the one area of concern that companies should be looking out for that you think the investment in communities can be looking for? But at the same time, let's balance that out with what you see as the opportunities. So Julie, if you want to take that to start with. Well, I think as exemplified by the J.P. Morgan Chase conference, bringing together the private and public sector and innovators to solve these issues. And that's where, when we have innovation and dramatic change and folks taking risks to solve these issues, I think that's that's where the optimism can be. 8,000 people showed up three years after COVID that uh, I think that, that exemplifies collaboration. Again, I'm pro-democracy, so I like to <laughs> I like to celebrate those types of uh, uh, trends. So that's great. There's no question collaboration seems to be on everyone's mind and sort of discussed when you sort of create that portfolio of companies within companies to sort of hedge some of those investments. So Robert, again, same kind of question to you. What is the, of many, what are the more specific area of concern you're looking at, but at the same time, what sort of a sunnier, hopeful opportunity do you present or see as well? I, look, the, the good news, in, in my, from my perspective, having uh, been through a few of these cycles before, is that we're reverting back to fundamentals, right? That people are starting to think about unit economics, uh, ROI, and hard dollar ROI, not soft dollar ROI, like uh, increased productivity, which is very hard to measure, um, and a real focus on outcomes and cost reductions. And so uh, I think that we're we're back in an era where the metrics matter, right? And those companies that are able to demonstrate, you know, quantifiable results are going to have success, um, you know. And uh, so, I, to me, that that's a that's a good thing. But we spent a lot of time in our portfolio helping our companies understand that, you know, this is a data driven world right now, and that you're going to need to show real hard results. Um, you know, to continue to attract capital and customers. You know, in terms of, you know, the the greener side of the equation, I, you know, there's still, um, we're still at the really early days of what this digital transformation looks like, right? You know, I, I'm a firm believer that in a few years from now, there won't be digital health, it'll just be health. And so really we're thinking about how do we integrate all these different care modalities, um, locations of care, uh, hybrid models with online, offline, um, you know, AI technologies, wearables. I mean, you know, we've got sort of this whole new tool set that we never really had before the last five, 10 years. Uh, and I think it's going to be transform transformative. I mean, certainly we have plenty of wood to chop when we think about chronic disease, acute conditions, um, even delays in care that were caused by the pandemic. Um, so no lack of issues to to, to focus on, but uh, I think a lot of opportunity to, to have impact, um, and and it's necessary. Like we need to focus on driving impact at scale, not incrementalism. And that and that actually ties into a lot of I mentioned the work I do is like you know humanizing digital transformation, which is just you're not bolting on technology. You actually need to involve the stakeholders in that process to ensure it's going to be used. And and get the kind and collect data, but also the real data that actually is actionable. So with that, and obviously because health apparently involves people, 
So I was sort of curious as to what your sort of thoughts were as, uh, you know, stand up in terms of consumer adoption. Like, what is, the, what is the one thing you're sort of seeing or would like, you know, in terms of that consumer side, since people really need to use this to be successful? I mean, look, that's, that's, that's the magic question, right? Is um, we're still learning as an industry how to empower consumers. And, and let me be clear, I'd use the word empower, not engage. Engage is the idea of somebody else trying to get you to do what they want you to do, right? Texting me 10 times a day and reminding me to check my BP only reminds me that I have a chronic disease. That doesn't make me want to be more compliant with my treatment regimen. So the idea really is to create empowerment, right? Connect the dots for people between you know, the data and the action, as you said, Howard, so that people can see the causal relationship, right? Like, what do you, what's your experience there? You go to the doctor, the doctor says, oh, you're overweight, you're at hypertension and you're hypolipidemic. And so you need to lose 50 pounds, start working out three days a week and change all your diet. Like nobody can comply with that kind of, you know, set of doctor requirements. So we have a lot to learn around creating longitudinal consumer adoption and behavioral change. And that's the hard part. I mean, I wish I could say we've all cracked the code there, but that's the hard part. That's great. It's okay with us. Uh, the 30 seconds, Julie, just for your uh, thoughts on that, because- uh, Yeah, well, the I think this ties degree. in beautifully to the previous panel and the focus on you know a system that measures outcomes and the, the more holistic approach as Robert just described, that's that's the future and, and it should be health, not digital health. I completely agree. Well, I have about a hundred more questions, but I don't think Stan would appreciate that. So maybe I'll send this back to you, Stan. But Robert and Julie, thank you so much for your thoughts and insights. Um, you know, a lot for us to think about and uh, to follow up on. Yeah, um, so. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you all. And again, uh, thank you, Howard, for a terrific interview. And I think a lot of lessons learned for our audience around the world and listening. And thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Appreciate it.